Major funding for Carolina Business Review is provided by Grant Thornton, an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. Novant Health, including Presbyterian in Charlotte and Forsyth in Winston-Salem, are affiliate heart hospitals of the Cleveland Clinic, consistently ranked number one in the nation for heart care. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, proudly serving South Carolinians since 1946. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Well, back in the summer of 2011, on the heels of Egypt's political unrest and widespread Middle Eastern political turbulence, the UN declared that disconnecting people from the Internet was a human rights violation and against international law. That is, of course, assuming they even had access or the ability to connect. Welcome back to the Carolina's Wide Dialogue on Business and Public Policy. I'm Chris William, and this week, the digital divide. According to a 2010 U.S. Census figure, 74 percent, almost three quarters of the households in this country, had at least one person with Internet access. And now, as more and more of our routine life events, utility, business, human services, and just in general, everyday lives migrate online, what happens to those who just plain either choose not to be connected to the web or just can't afford it? Are they left behind? Do they become less relevant? We take on this discussion with our panel of experts in just a moment. Major funding also by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation in Charlotte enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs. Join Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. The view was recorded February 8, 2013. On this week's program, Angie Bailey of the North Carolina Department of Commerce, Dr. Dirk Brown of the University of South Carolina, Joe Fidoso of MCNC, and John Warner of InnoVenture LLC. Now, Chris William. Hello, welcome to our program. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, welcome back to you all. Angie, welcome to this crowd. And Thanks. good luck trying to jump in here, by the way. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm going to say this kiddingly, but I, I think you all will kind of get the gist of it. What would have happened if Al Gore would not have invented the Internet? And, and what I mean by that, you know, we all kind of laugh at that. But, Joe, let me start with you. Um, we go back to some comments uh, uh, that we said here at the top of the program about d do people become less relevant, whether they can't afford it or they just choose not to be logged in? Chris, I think you hit on something in the intro in that when you think about healthcare today, when you think about educational attainment, when you think about economic vitality, a lot of that growth in a state or in a region is going to happen online. And the infrastructure that you have, the accessibility of affordable internet for folks truly defines whether they are relevant or not, I think, in today's world. It gives you a voice. It gives you access. And it's today's communication infrastructure and communication realm. And we've made it critical, right? You get a difference in care if you're online um, as a patient. If you're non-ambulatory and can't get to a hospital, um, the ability to bring telehealth into your home depends on a very high speed connection with low latency. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it, it really defines kind of your access to services and your voice in the world. So I would agree with what the UN uh, put forth that if you're disconnected, you become less relevant. About being a human rights issue. J John, let me come back to something. You know, I would say all of us that sit around this table and a lot of people that watch this program or, or, or not, prize their time off. And when we have numerous PDAs, uh, you know, I embedded technology, whatever, how, where is that tipping point between being, you know, and I know you've been in technology for a long time, InnoVenture and many other things, but where is that tipping point and how do you, how do you counter this whole idea of having to have such a broad internet access all the time so we're logged in all the time and prizing your time? Where is that? So my family's going to tell you that I'm the absolutely worst person about to it. ask about yeah. when to turn it off. 
um, we were in the um, reception area waiting on the program here, and all of us had our phones out. We're checking our email, and we're all we're all um, connected. Um, you know, I, it, it is a 24/7 world, and you know, at any given point in time, you're connected. And it impresses me that the you know you can be talking to people around the world. It doesn't matter if they're down the street or in Bangalore, India. You know, you're you're connected all the time. But it is important, I think, to take time to disconnect mm -hmm. and um, unwind for a while. I, I like to hike on the weekends. And when I do, I turn them all off and really? get out to nature. Really? Do you turn them off when, you, when you're out there? I do, yeah. <laughs> well, because because you just have to find a time when you when you disengage or it'll just drive you nuts, I think. You know, I, I, I'll jump in here real quick, if you don't mind, John. My, my perspective, when people ask that question, I always sort of roll my eyes just a little bit because it's, it, you know, if you can think about 30 years ago, would you say, well, we have this thing called a telephone and it, it interrupts me and rings every time I'm at home trying to relax. And so I think I think it's a, we, we, certainly, have, we certainly have gone through a cultural shift, there's no question, but that's, the technology is not responsible for that. It's a, it's a cultural issue. And if you look at the internet as a whole, sort of holistically from an economic development perspective, a quality of life yeah, perspective right. that Joseph, there's no question in my mind, uh, it's, a, it's a fundamentally important to, if you look at the economic development of uh, developed countries now, 20, 20, over 20% 20 of the growth, economic growth of countries is internet based, you know, more, than, more so than energy, more so than agriculture. So there's no question in my mind that digital connectivity is, um, is important. In fact, uh, one of the most important things you can have for developing uh, countries, developing people's lives, and whether or not you turn your BlackBerry or your, or your iPhone off or on during the weekend, to me, is secondary, and it's a cultural, it's a cultural issue that we can all deal with sort of on our own. You know, own. I, I want to stay with this just for a second, Angie, and I want to ask you this. So, you know, all of us sitting around this table, uh, we thought, okay, how it is now was not like it was before, but there's a whole demographic, a couple demographics, that it's always been that way in their lives. It hasn't been always that way in our life, but in their life, and I'm talking about Generation Z and Generation right. X, it's always been that way. So how, I mean, we've got a whole, how does that square with everything we talked about, Angie? Well, I think that when you're talking about, if you're talking about the digital divide, yes. and you're talking about being connected 24-7, I think folks that advocate for more broadband and better broadband um, for everyone, it's not about being connected all the time. It's about being connected when you need to be. You know, if you need to take an online class, then you need to have some way to do that. Or if you need to telework or you have a home-based business. Um, so I think at least as far as advocating for, for broadband for everyone at some capacity, it's about um, finding mm -hmm. a solution to that issue, but not necessarily pushing for everyone to be online all the time. Okay, so, and let me throw this one out, and, it, and, and anyone jump in now. So what about the people that don't want to be connected? Are they relevant? Are they missing something? Or are we looking at this too extreme? Either you, you're online or you're not online. So, let me give you an example, Chris, because I, I don't think the people who don't want to be connected or don't want to be connected 24-7 uh, lose, lose relevance in society. Or so, competitive age? Yeah. I, um, but but let's look at a let's look at a more traditional industry or, and a person involved in that. I know a potato farmer in northeastern North Carolina. When he's out in the field, he still has to be checking in real time the commodity prices for those potatoes because he wants to get the best price, whether it's from Frito Lay or from a uh, you know a, a, a potato uh, distributor. He doesn't necessarily care about his home connection. What he cares about is being able to check real time from the field. So anytime, anywhere, he wants the availability of service, but he's not exactly what I would call uh, a prisoner to that service at home. It may not have permeated uh, his entire life as it is with some of us being power users around the table where we live kind of online or with Gen, Gen X and Gen Z, but it's important to his business now and it's relevant for his business so that he can real time check those commodity prices and get the best yeah. price for his potatoes and hire more people and again, work through uh, using it as part of his life. So I think choice the ability that where you don't have choice makes you less relevant. So le okay, so so let's back up then. Let's zoom out here a little bit, and let's talk about the whole idea of internet being a human right, as the UN has said. And, and now a German court has said, quote unquote, it's essential is owning a car or a refrigerator, which takes it even more, you know, to a common denominator. So I guess the question is, is internet access should it be free? Is it a utility? Should it, and I know how, I think I know 
a little bit how you two are going to come at it. But John, I want you to start that. Is this just something like um, electric power, water and sewer? Do we just need to have this and not be a commercial enterprise, but government or some agency or NGO needs to be in charge of this or pushing it? Well, neither water nor utilities are free. I mean, they cost something, and, and delivering the Internet's not free. Um, you know, I think most things are best served when the market serves them, um, and capital will be allocated most efficiently when that happens. Uh, the problem is that some people might get left behind if you just have a completely unfettered free market. And so rather than funding the Internet or funding connectivity, I think you need to fund people. Uh, you know, you need what to help. What does that look like? Um, well, and, you know, if, if people don't have the resources to do what's necessary, whether it's buy electricity or, you know, water or access to the Internet, then let's do what's necessary to help them um, get the basic needs that they, mm -hmm. that they need. Um, and some people, that's help with training so that they can get a job. Um, there may be other people that, because of their age or their disability, they just... You know, we, we just need to make sure that they're taken care of. But I don't think you, I think you start running into problems when you start subsidizing a particular good because then um, you, you run into problems where they're not maintained properly, they tend to run down, mm -hmm. and, and all of a sudden you have, um, you, you, you create problems that way. So I would, I would keep things as market-based as we could and let's focus on making sure that nobody gets left behind in this process. Uh, okay, Dirk, so as an academic and a capitalist all together in one, how, how do you look at that <laughs> idea? <laughs> um, should it be commercial or should it be some utility type well, of Well, and to, to a large extent, I agree with, um, with what John said, surprisingly, John. Um, but the, <laughs> the, uh, if you look at uh, worldwide how Internet is being, um, how access to Internet is being introduced to various countries, and you look at what we do in the U.S., and actually, harken back to my comment earlier about the telephone as a, as a comparable. So we had this 1936, um, you know, for the rural sectors of the United States, we had this Rural uh, Electrification Act that was to get electricity out. That's a pretty basic need that we have in this country, right? So we had a, uh, an act to, to push this electricity out. And then we, we added on to that the ability to have these consortia to help get telephone connectivity out into areas where, of the country where it was hard to have telephone access. And what people, I think, forget, we have now in this country 1,400 of these consortia sort of groups that are getting telephone access to rural areas of the country where, where it's hard to get otherwise in a normal commercial environment. And the majority, the vast majority of these are uh, private, nonprofit. So it's not the government doing it for you, and it's not um, pure capitalist uh, incentive. It's this, um, the, the free market serving the need. And so you don't it's a have cooperative. To, we were yeah, talking about cooperative. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I, uh, that's what I meant to say, mm -hmm. yeah. Joe, is that, is that how it's so, going to be deployed here in North Carolina, cooperatively? Yeah. It, you know, uh, Chris, our story is a little bit different. So we're, we are of that private nonprofit mode that, that uh, Dirk just described. And uh, we are building infrastructure uh, throughout the state. But here's, here's, where I would, uh, um, here's where I would define this. Um, we are never in this space going different from kind of the electric utility space and and uh, um, uh, the the water and sewer and natural gas. The last mile of this technology is constantly changing and constantly innovating, and there's investment there and there's opportunities for private sector companies to make money in that space and delivering last mile services. So AT and T, for example, a couple of months ago. It announced a $14 billion investment. They spend more CapEx on their network uh, than just about any company in the U.S. and any company globally. And they can keep up with that innovation to serve their customers in the last mile. It's moving away from a wired infrastructure into everybody's house and more to a wireless solution, a fourth generation wireless or LTE mm -hmm. technology. And I think we need to let companies like that blossom and continue to make those investments and make money off of those investments. The question comes, you always need the base of the pipes, which in this case is fiber, to carry that traffic back to the internet from that wireless connectivity on the outside. And I think in areas where that uh, fiber infrastructure can't be built, 
that there has to be public-private partnership or cooperative partnership in order to get that infrastructure out there. And then let the innovative last mile companies, those that are forward thinking, that where they can actually monetize mm -hmm. that investment mm -hmm. by reaching businesses and consumers in the last mile, take advantage of that infrastructure. Okay, so you, so uh, uh, Angie, you, you, what about this whole idea the FCC wants to have super Wi-Fi across the country, free super Wi-Fi across the country? Is this, is this a pipe dream? Is this just bad leadership by the FCC? I think we have to wait and see, to be honest. I mean, I don't think it's a, it's a, I think it's good that they're thinking uh, progressively on how we can move the country forward, and especially an initiative like that where you could be serving folks that don't already have service. Um, but I think as far as what Joe was saying, you know, the private sector providers, they want to mm -hmm. serve the state, and they want, that's what they mm -hmm. do. This is their business, whether they, they're a cable company or DSL or fiber or mobile. Um, so, and they're serving about 97% of the state right now. Um, and like Joe's saying, the issue is these pockets, they're scattered pockets all over the place. And so, that are close to existing infrastructure. So, it, you know, if you can, if you can put together public-private partnerships to figure out how to serve those pockets, that's going to be the solution, I think. And you would, um, would you say another issue is cost? Because I know we talk, we're talking about access, just pure access, but you mean um, end, end user cost? End user cost, like, consumer cost. Yeah. Well, cost, and I think moving forward, the issues are going to be speed and capacity. You know, what everyone might be served, but then or do people have high enough yeah. speeds? Because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a capitalist, and, and I, I really believe in the free market system. But yeah. uh, I will say that the competitive landscape in this particular market space is uh, a little bit tough for the consumer because most vast majority, almost everyone in the U.S., has only one or two providers that can really provide them access. And so if you look at cost of internet access for the consumer in the U.S., for example, it's, it's six and a half times or more most many Asian countries, Korea for sure, but um, Japan, you know, Taiwan, Hong Kong. And so what I worry about, we talked about the ubiquity of access for internet. There's one thing is just the ability to access it. The other one is the affordability. Mm -hmm. you, you don't want to know my phone bill. <laughs> uh, my, 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 <laughs> about that, John. Don't you worry about that? Don't you think, well, wait a minute, the Telecom Act back in the late 90s, shouldn't all these costs be coming down as competition right. heats up? It's pretty expensive, um, wireless access, when, you, when you're a power user, like you mentioned. Um, I, I want to mention something else. You asked a question a while ago, is if you're not online, are you relevant? Can you, can you do that? And, and so if we even take um, business people, not, not just the, the folks that um, are... Uh, um, low income, but normal business people that aren't online. And I think that's a very dangerous thing. Um, the places that are most innovative and creative um, have rich ecosystems where parts and pieces get put together. So if you look at Silicon Valley or Austin, Texas, or, um, you know, there's, there's rich, um, deep connections. And so um, people are innovative and creative, not just with what they have, but by connecting with other people. And all of a sudden, you know, I find myself I'm able to Skype with somebody in Portugal or South Africa or India or Asia, and it's just seamless and it's easy and you don't think about it. You know, you flip on your laptop and all of a sudden you're connecting with people around the world and that connectivity is a part of what makes you creative and innovative. And if you choose to disconnect yourself from that, I think that's a very dangerous thing. And so you see it happen in companies sometimes where they create firewalls where the employees can't access the internet because they're worried about it being unproductive on Facebook or something, but they cut them, they cut them off also from the opportunity to connect with other people. Um, when you are connected like this, you run into the opposite problem of just being overwhelmed by the noise. So of the people that I know that are powered users, the big challenge is how do you pull the signal out of the noise? How do you find what's interesting, what's important out of just the malay of stuff that I have to deal with? And for the people in you know, the world I live in, that's the big challenge we have is you know, how do you get it to a point where you can deal with it? It's like drinking out of a fire hose. I mean, there's, there, there's so much information. Let me come back to North Carolina for just a second. How, and Joe, this question's to you. There's a political shift now mm -hmm. in North Carolina. Clearly, Republicans uh, have a majority in the, in the House, in the Senate, and also in the governor's mansion now. So as they, re, as they talk a lot about, uh, and not long on this program, Senator Bob Rucho, who's the point man for the for the, the Senate and also the Republicans talking about tax reform, as they push toward that, how, do, how does all of this fall into what the new landscape in public policy is going to? 
uh, Chris, I think a couple of things when 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 I start to when I start to uh, mesh broadband in with uh, with the the change in leadership in North Carolina. We've done some really good things in a bipartisan way the last 20 years in North Carolina. Um, we centrally fund, for example, connectivity, uh, high bandwidth mm -hmm. connectivity uh, to community colleges, to the university system, to K through 12 schools in the state. And we happen to have bid for as a nonprofit and won the right to host that network that provides that connectivity. We have very, very high bandwidth connectivity. It's a good value. We've got to look at that now and say, does that permeate the school? Because there are trends happening in K through 12 as we move towards common core standards and as we move towards uh, on, more online assessment and online professional development, that those anchor institutions need to have multi-gigabit connectivity. Mm -hmm. But then you look at it and you say, we've still got an issue here, okay? We've got an issue that if, as we put more and more curriculum online, do we automatically disconnect kids that are on free and reduced lunch that don't have access at home or that can't afford it to some of John's points that he made? It's not just information drinking from the high, fire hose. It's critical information about educational attainment. And I've seen some really positive things. If you look at what uh, Representative Craig Horn and Senator Dan Socek had done, they, they chaired a digital learning um, special committee during the, during the uh, break in, leg in legislative sessions this time. And they came out and said, you know, this is important. We have got to look forward. And, uh, you know, now we've got an asset statewide through the $140 million investment that we're making in broadband infrastructure in the state that can be a piece of this, that can be a piece in making sure that those kids, when they come home, have access at home so that they continue their studies that they heard. Okay, so j not to interrupt you, but quickly, so does this does this strengthen the argument for those, Republican or Democrat, that have said, no, 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 we don't need to be cutting education, even as critical as our budgets are, we need to be leaning into education, yeah. or does it become an, just a, uh, what well, is another infrastructure that's going to have to take a priority behind our roads and our schools? Chris, yeah. I, think, I think there's something important here, and that is, Anytime you take a, a model and you try to cram technology into it, it, it often doesn't work. And I think in education, especially public education, we take a classroom that was designed for a teacher to stand up in the front mm -hmm. and lecture to the class, and all of a sudden we assume that if we cram information technology into it, she's going to be a whole lot better off. And what we need is to provide more flexibility. You mentioned Common Core. Um, you know, we're, we're starting to, to constrict what teachers can teach because they're going to teach to the test and what we need to be doing is letting them create entirely new models around this new technology. It used to be that education was very personalized. In the Industrial Revolution we needed to educate, educate mass numbers of people so we developed this kind of industrial education system where everybody goes through it you know, in the same rate and learns you know, a certain amount of information and what technology is going to do is get us back to a more personalized yeah. kinds of education. We, we have two minutes left and I want to, and this is just a plug, uh, uh, on April 4th on ETV in South Carolina will be the Carolina Business Review Education Summit we've done in conjunction with many including the South Carolina Chamber and uh, technology is an important part of that dialogue. Just very quickly Dirk, you are right at the nexus of education at the Darla Moore School as well as Pandoodle as as well as this 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 whole idea of yours, how do you see this education piece strengthening the argument about being plugged in? Yeah, there's no there's no question. The data is very clear that um, bringing technology in the classroom and internet connectivity to the classroom is a good thing at any level. What John's talking about is optimizing that. But over 80 percent of teachers have said that not not only are students more engaged, their work product is of, of higher quality. So the data there is, in my mind, unambiguous. What the Carolinas are doing, which is interesting, is we're focusing on folks that don't have access, and we're doing a good job of it. Thank you very much, Joe. And we're also focusing on state-of-the-art, cutting-edge technology. So we have, uh, most people don't know this, but the two dominant players in telepresence, so vir you know, being able to see video conferencing at very high resolution, the two dominant players, the only place, the only place that Polycom and Cisco units will actually interoperate is in South Carolina. So what we're doing as the Carolinas... And they're competitors for those that are strong don't. Polycom competitors, and strong Cisco. Competitors. Yeah, so, they're, so what I'm saying is that, that the Carolinas has actually taken a leadership role, in my mind, in the nation, in driving both access to the have-nots who need it and um, cutting-edge technologies that are going to represent the next generation of this Internet connectivity. So in, we have 30 seconds left. Is education the Trojan horse to get this thing out? 
I think it's a big focus. I mean, there's already two bills in the legislature. They've been in, in the North Carolina legislature in a week, for a week and a half. Yeah, focused on uh, getting access to kids after at school and after okay. school. That's going to be the last word. And Angie, you know, we didn't give you a chance to talk a lot, so you're going to have to come back. I told you it was a bit of a free for all. One. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Nice to see you. And, but well, there's a me. lot to there's a lot to the subject. Yeah, there it's is. Complex. I appreciate it. Thank you, John. Good to see you again. Thank good you. Good to be here. Dirk, good to have you back. Thank you. Joe, it's been six years and too long. Come back, please. I will. Thank you. Until next week, I'm Chris William. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation in Charlotte enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton, an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. Novant Health, including Presbyterian in Charlotte and Forsyth in Winston-Salem, are affiliate heart hospitals of the Cleveland Clinic, consistently ranked number one in the nation for heart care. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, proudly serving South Carolinians since 1946. Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.com.